Well, grab your Bibles and turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 in our study. And we're going to be looking at the first of the seven churches. But before we do that, mark down, if you would, the title of this message. In fact, they'll all be very, very similar, except for the address. The address of the letter will end, or I should say arrive, at a different place. At a different place. Both, listen, a different place 2,000 years ago when this was given, and a different place in our time right now in the world where we're at, in our hearts. The Word of God arrives. The title will be this today. My dear Ephesus, I've written you a letter. My dear Ephesus, Jesus is saying, I've written you a letter. And so in our uh, responsive reading that we're going to uh, fudge on a little bit because we're not together right now. By the way, I can't wait until we get back together. So we're going through this time of experiment until we see you again face to face. I will read all the way through. But you know what? I got to tell you before I do that, I think it's safe to say, hear me out carefully. I think it's safe to say that every pulpit all around the world on this Lord's Day on Sunday pastors are naturally de delivering sermons of hope, sermons of peace, sermons to bring encouragement, and I agree with that. I'm going to give a message that's going to be bringing hope and be bringing peace and bringing encouragement, but I want to deliver it in a way that I believe the Lord has been speaking to my heart about, and I trust and I pray that you will understand because it's God's chronology of speaking to his people. Very, very important. And so Revelation chapter 2, beginning of verse 1. John says, because it was given to John, he writes this down, but he's speaking or writing on behalf of Christ. To the angel of the church at Ephesus, write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them to be liars. And you have persevered, and you have patience, and you have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Verse 4, nevertheless... I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent. Do your first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Verse 6 goes on to say, But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate, says Jesus, and he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to him from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Let's pray. Father, we ask you, Lord, now again that you'd speak to us out of your word with great power and great application. And Lord, I pray that you would give me the ability to deliver a topical sermon one that would address, Lord, your word rightly and speak to our hearts correctly. So, Father, we ask you now to inhabit our praises. In your holy name we pray. So, obviously, we're in the book of Revelation, and the book of Revelation is exactly that. The word apocalypse or apocalyptic is that it is the revealing of, the unveiling. If you had a, a uh, a great monument or maybe a great statue that was veiled. The artist had finished his sculpture and uh, before all the lights are turned on it and before everything is uh, seen publicly, it is veiled. Maybe like a beautiful piece of art, it's veiled until there is the unveiling. And the book of Revelation is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. That's what the book of Revelation is all about. If you look carefully at the, um, at least you should, See at the top of your Bible there in the book of Revelation, right above chapter 1. It says there, the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
Not the revelation of St. John, but the revelation of Jesus Christ, the person of who Jesus Christ is. So this book is featuring the central figure of the entire Bible itself, and that is Jesus Christ. You know, it's interesting to me that there are some religions, there are some groups that say you can't or you should not study the book of Revelation, that it's a closed book. My dear friends, it's the exact opposite. In fact, if you take the time later today to read chapter one, it will tell you that it is a book that is to be both read and listened to, and to all those who read it and to those who hear it, there's a special blessing that will be placed upon their lives. No other book of the Bible promises such an amazing thing. But I also believe that's exactly why Satan doesn't want people to read the book of Revelation. I mean, come on, it's, it's bad press for the devil. It's bad press for him because it's this revelation of Jesus that teaches us the restoration of all things. It teaches us all about the fact that Satan will be bound up, that his attempt to overthrow the kingdom of God is thwarted by Christ, and that he in fact is bound for a thousand years, and then eventually Satan himself is thrown into the lake of fire, where he will reside forever. I can almost hear a clap, I hope, in some of your homes or offices, or hotels, wherever you're at, that one day Satan will be bound. All of the lying, all of the murder, all of the brokenness, all of the hurt, all of the pain will go down into the pit where it belongs with the wicked one. But this is an important thing. This is a powerful thing to remember, that Christ is a central figure. But as we get ready to hear this study, we have to remember this. Jesus Christ, in the Revelation, is the culmination of all of his ministry aspects. Say, Jack, what do you mean by that? Well, Jesus Christ in the Gospels is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, John tells us. We also know that according to the Bible that Jesus is our priest. He's our priesthood. The book of Hebrews tells us about his great everlasting priesthood, uh, that we are to confess to Christ the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, and not to man. By the way, I don't know if you saw this uh, headline news this last week, but the Pope in Rome said that because you cannot get to a priest during this time of disease and pestilence on the earth, that it's okay, says the Pope, to confess your sins directly to God. I saw that article and I got a big smile and I went right over to Lisa, my wife, and I said, look at this. And she read it and we both looked at each other and smiled because that's exactly what the Bible says. The Bible tells us to go directly to Christ. Paul writes to Timothy and says that there's one mediator between man and God and that is the man, Christ Jesus, his everlasting priesthood. You go to directly to Christ. You don't go to a pastor. You don't have to go to a priest. The Bible says you can go directly to Christ. What a great comfort that is to the lonely and to the outcast and to those who are sensing a great need to pursue Christ today, as I hope you are. But not only those things, but the fact of the matter is, the Bible teaches us, thirdly, that Jesus Christ is judge, that he's the judge. Christ, in the end, will judge all things. But as we look at this, that's what we're seeing. And I don't say this to upset anybody. By the way, this message I'm giving is directly geared to the church. Now, if you're not a Christian today, by all means, listen up. And here's the fun part of it. You can listen up so you know what to do regarding your Christian friend. You can hold them accountable to what they heard today. But I do hope if you're not a born-again believer, that is a transformed individual, if if you've not transformed or experienced the transformation power of Christ, uh, I hope that changes in your life today, but I want to talk about this very important message that Jesus gives to the church at Ephesus. And the things that are going on in the world around us, the question is this, what what is God saying to the church? What's God speaking to the church in the world right now? God is talking to every Christian, to every pastor in the world right now. And we need to be asking the question, what is it? 
And I personally believe that the events of this world right now, God is using for a very specific purpose, and I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever that God is speaking. What we need to do, what I need to do, is tune in and listen. But many things are certain, I believe, at this time. I know many people don't feel like it, but there are certain things. And I believe that certain things are clear. But to me, nothing is more certain and more clear than the fact that God is speaking right now in the way of mercy. Mercy. I'm just relating it to the fact that this whole thing about um, this virus... It's a merciful thing. You say, Pastor, how can you say that when my mom died or my child died or whatever the case may be? Listen, people die. We're all going to die by whatever means. By the way, scientists right now, researchers are telling us right now that the current death rate in the world that is taking place does not set this season, this time, outside the realm or the brackets of normal. We're not hearing that on the news, that the death rate of the flu season is at a normal. Yes, it's an aggressive flu. Yes, it's an aggressive disease, this virus. But the fact of the matter is, if it wasn't coronavirus, it would be something else. And next year, there's going to be something else. And the year after that, there's going to be something else. But my question to you is, what are you doing to be prepared for days like this? I believe God is speaking, and mark it down, please, I believe that God is speaking in mercy. Because if you get sick, you can start thinking thoughts toward God, and you can make a decision about God, and you can wonder about eternity. That's what Christ wants you to think about. But this morning, all around the world, there's a silence. The wheels of industry have silenced the sound of people buying and selling have been silenced. There's no traffic here in Los Angeles. It's very eerie, and I'm not saying that to be funny. You, at any time of the day, you can go out on our LA freeways and drive at full speed, no traffic. It's very strange for us. There's no baseball games, which as Americans, this is a big deal. There's nobody going to the mall Nobody's attending stadiums for various events. I saw recently this week that the Vatican has been, become silent as people are not allowed to gather. You think about that for a moment. The Vatican's empty. The Vatican is silent. And then I saw a clip regarding the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and it's absolutely silent. Nobody's there. And then in Saudi Arabia, the Muslims have the Kaaba, and normally it's filled with tens of thousands or a million worshipers that walk around that black box of Islam, and it's empty. And there's a strange silence. In fact, Saudi Arabia announced on Tuesday that all the mosques would no longer permit its worshipers to gather all around the world. You say, well, pastor, didn't our nation say the same thing? Isn't the United States telling our worshipers not to gather? You know what? Our, uh, uh, our government has requested that people not gather, and people are being obedient, and people are, are being cautious about that, but there was no official demand that it could have been. It, could, it didn't come down as strong as it could have been, but even with that, I want to challenge you. The Vatican is silent, the Temple Mount is silent, the Kaaba is silent. But don't think for a moment that the church is silent. Don't think for a moment that when you see an empty church with nobody in it, that the church is somehow silent. Listen, that building is not the church. That's what's so awesome about being a Christian. The building is not the church. The people are the church. And right now in your homes all around the world, you're having church. The elements in this time have brought you to a place of having church. And to that I want to speak to you about. We've all been um, brought under what they're calling, because it sounds good, rather than martial law. They've called it sheltering in place. And just, uh, again, in the Southland, in Southern California, you can go down the streets of L.A., and there's an eeriness, and there's an emptiness, and there's a stillness of it all. 
It's very, very odd and very, very strange. But so we experience this interesting time and we ask the question, what's going on? What's happening? What in the world is taking place in our culture today? And what is going on in our hearts and in our minds? Our attention has been seized and grabbed. And God wants, and he has always wanted his church to experience exactly what he is saying. But you and I are prone to destruction. And seemingly God has shut everything down. And so I want to point out five things for you, devotionally speaking this morning, to consider. When the Bible says, my dear Ephesus, I've written you a letter. Look at verse 1 in your Bible, Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. Revelation 2, 1 says, to the angel of the church at Ephesus, write these things, says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. The first thing I want you to write down, friends, is this. When Jesus says, I've written you a letter, Ephesus, it's so that we might listen to what he is saying. Will you write that down? So listen to what I am saying to you. I believe that at this hour, God is using this moment to speak to us, and he's saying to us, listen to what I'm telling you. Pastor, listen to what I'm telling you. And I mean that sincerely. When it says the angel, he writes to the angel of the church who is, who is at Ephesus. The word angel is anglios. It's translated messenger. It's most often for 2,000 years believed to mean or reference the pastor of the church at Ephesus. Ephesus, a great city of commerce 2,000 years ago. One of the biggest money-making locations of the Roman Empire. It was the epicenter of the worship of Artemis, or you know that deity, as Diana. And Diana was the chief goddess of that, and patron saint or goddess, I should say, of the city of Ephesus. The word Ephesus means, interesting meaning, the word Ephesus means uh, desirable or um, delightful. It's, uh, it's a word that means pleasant. It, it means, by the way, uh, it can mean uh, tolerant. It can mean uh, welcoming. It was a tremendous city with a tremendous name and a tremendous history. But the Bible here says that God is speaking via and to the pastor or the messenger of that church. And he's challenging that church to consider several things. These things says he who holds the seven stars. So God has in his possession, Jesus does, these messengers. Every church that is called by God, and might I add, might I put it this way? Just because somebody starts a church doesn't mean it's a church that's started by God. There's a lot of churches out there that God is not welcome in. It goes by the name of church. Or it might have the legal status of a church. It might have the label of a church. But there's no manifest evidence of God ever beginning that work or sustaining that work and giving that work vision. Here, Jesus is saying, I own the church that is at Ephesus. And wherever you're at, the Bible teaches us that God owns the church and that community. Those churches belong to him and that he holds the seven stars in his right hand. The right hand in the Bible is referred to as the place of power, strength, and protection, and that he walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. So we want to ask or remind ourselves, what is it that God is saying? He's announcing that it's a time of listening. What, what am I saying to you is what the Lord is announcing to the church. Have you noticed that at a time like this, many churches have stepped up and in the hour of trial and testing, they've become, as it were, more glorious. Can I say, uh, more golden. Their light is brighter now. I don't, it's so amazing. I'm speaking to you in a congregation that is empty, as it were, an auditorium that is black. And yet, there's more light going out now and that light is landing in more places now than ever before. Only God could have done that. The golden lampstands, 
the Bible says he walks through the midst of them. If you ever get a chance to visit this church, you can enter into the main entrance of the foyer and there's a 2,000 pound stone of uncut Jerusalem rock. And grafted into that great rock, that great 2,000 pound boulder is a seven lamp stand, the menorah. It's found in the book of Genesis, or Exodus, I should say, and then finally in the book of Revelation, the seven lamp stand, not the Hanukkah light or the, the nine branches, the seven branches is biblical. Jesus says that he walks through the midst of them. He's walking through the midst of these seven churches. Seven churches that represent the church throughout all the last 2,000 years and seven churches by nature and description represent any given Christian at any given time where your heart is at. So it's a manifest observation. Jesus has been holding his church and its leaders and he's gonna hold his church and his leaders until he comes for the church. And when he walks through the midst of the lampstands, he's speaking about fellowship. So the question is, what is he saying to you today as a Christian? Notice, we've all been reduced, as it were, down to our own space, no pun intended, our own <laughs> six-foot space. And here in the United States, we're supposed to keep six feet away from each other. Somebody wrote me and asked me if that applied to their spouse. I don't know if that was a letter of wishful thinking or an honest question, but... <laughs> No, it doesn't apply to your spouse or your, your family, assuming that you're healthy. But what God is saying to you in your space matters. And I would think that God is saying to us today that we need to get alone more, we need to get silent, we need to get quiet. I think God is in the silence. I think God is shouting in the silence. The world has got to hush coming down here this morning none of our parks were filled with soccer players today no kids playing soccer I'm probably going to get hate mail for this but that's a good thing have you noticed distractions have evaporated why because I believe God wants to speak and we need to ask the question of ourselves Christians we need to get on our knees and get alone and say, Lord, what is it that you're saying to me? Lord, if you were to examine my life as a church, if you were to say, my dear Mary, my dear Bob, I've written you a letter. And this is what I'm saying to you. So listen, Christian, God is speaking. Secondly, I want to point out that in verses 2, the Bible here teaches us, I believe, that Jesus is saying, my dear Ephesus, I'm, I've written you a letter, so look at what I'm showing you. Not only to listen to what I'm saying, but to look at what I'm showing you. He says in verse two, I know your works. This is beautiful of Jesus. I know your, I know your works, your labor. He's not, listen, he's not uninformed of your good works for Christ and your good deeds, Christian Thank God for them. I thank God for the good works and the good deeds that those who know Christ do. Your patience. The word patience here means uh, the word that it's a patience that bears up under intense scrutiny, great weight. You're patient. You don't jump out of the frying pan, as it were, into the fire, but you're hanging on and you're trusting Christ. All around the world, we're being called to hang on and trust Christ. Boy, I gotta tell you, and I don't wanna divert from my notes, but I gotta tell you what springs up in my heart. And I pray that this is going on in your nation, wherever you may be. And I made mention of it last week. But the things that are taking place regarding works and labors for good here in America is so impressive. The love of people, the care of people, I've not seen in a long time. And just this week we heard that in an area of Texas where the hospital is under great quarantine and all of the nurses and all of the doctors cannot go home, 
They've all been exposed. That people began to show up in the parking lot and the streets around that hospital and they turned on their emergency flashers on their vehicles. All of them. And they began by sending that message and it was made known, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're doing this, sending a message that when those who look out the window of the hospital see our flashers blinking on our cars, they know we are praying for them. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men (laughs) that when they see your what? Good works, that they might glorify your Father which is in heaven. What an amazing thing. What an amazing, simple thing that is that people would pull up before a police station or a hospital and just turn on the blinkers anytime, day or night, to say, I'm praying for you. I gotta keep my distance, I cannot talk to you, I cannot get close to you, but I'm praying for you. And I would submit to you that that is a tremendous power and a closeness that transcends any physical closeness. Look at what I'm showing you, God is saying. In neighborhoods, in towns, in cities, and listen, I want, to re- I want to give this, and I have no authority but, the, but what Christ might give me. We need to stop complaining. We need to stop griping. I'm watching the mayor of New York City just complain and complain and complain. This is not an hour of complaining. This is an hour to give hope and to give peace and to give encouragement. This is a time when we pull together and stop devouring each other as political or as some political players are doing. We should be ashamed of ourselves. We need to stop and look and see what God is showing us. He says, I know this. He says that you cannot bear those who are evil. So listen, as a Christian and as a church, the church at Ephesus was right on. They they stood against evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not. You know what that means? It means that they had the ability to flush out fake teachers. Sounds like Second Peter. They had the ability, given by God, because they knew the Bible. Imagine, remember this too. They had a f- a fragments or parts of what we call today the New Testament. They had all of the Old Testament, but that was enough. The book of Revelation that we're looking at here was written in the year 95 A.D., and uh, there's, there were previous books of the New Testament available to the church, and they're reading them. And here Jesus commends the church at Ephesus, you know evil when you see it, and you know false teachers when you see them. And that's a great thing. That, that's, that's a great compliment. You can't say that much today. But they did, and they were doing it. And he says, you have found them to be liars. Speaking about the doctrine of God, God's Bible, this word of God just sifts through our mind and our mouths and our lives and flushes out what's evil. This book is true. The Bible says all men are liars. Ladies, don't think you're off the hook. The Bible says all men. It means that all of mankind are liars. We have an overwhelming propensity to lie because we're fallen creatures. And even the Christian, we might go on a Christian fishing trip on a Christian boat with a bunch of Christians and catch a fish. By the time we get home, that six-inch minnow, by the time we get home, we tell our wife, that thing was six feet. There's something in us. And uh, the Bible flushes that out. The book of James, chapter 1, verse 22 says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. So you don't want to become a theologian that stays in their office. You want to become a theologian that becomes a disciple. This is very important. It does no one any good if you just sit indoors and study the Bible. There's a lot of armchair theologians today with the birth of the internet. Everybody has become a theological expert. I laugh, it's hilarious, at the critics 
of the church today, but they never leave their basement. They never bury anybody. They're never there when someone passes from this world to the next. They're never there to separate the family that's in a feud. They don't know what it is. They study and they talk. And according to God, that is very Nicolaitan. Nicolaitan meaning that is very, very academic. You get knowledge, but without use of it, you wind up becoming heady, thinking highly of yourself, and you become, listen, impractical. The worst thing that a church can become is impractical. It's a tragedy. And then comes along a virus. And many churches in the world have now stepped into a beautiful glory of humbling themselves and serving one another, serving unbelievers, serving those who hate us. And we love it because it's exactly what Jesus would do. And so James goes on to say, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself but goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Boy, isn't that true? <laughs> um, life is sometimes merciful. So, you know, when you're young, you're beautiful. Right, you got smooth skin and you know, whatever attributes you enjoy now or some of us once had. But you look in a mirror, you know, when you look at a mirror, if you, if you look at a mirror long enough to just, you know, dust off your hair and take off, that works fine until you have more miles behind you as a believer or the years catch up to you. And you look in a mirror and you see all of the signs of pain or weather or time or the ravages of what sin does to the entire world. And we age and we grow older. And such is life in this world until Christ comes. But we observe our face in a, in a mirror. And I, I find it funny that uh, sometimes I get an, uh, the boldness to look at, you know those magnifying mirrors? They're usually round. They don't have to be. But one side's normal and then one side's radically magnified. I look at one side and it's normal. But listen, because my eyesight's not as good as it was, I look at the normal mirror and I go, all right, good to go. And then if, just out of curiosity, I flip it around and now it's all magnified and I can see everything about my face. <laughs> and it's like, what in the world? I didn't know hair grows there. I didn't know that I had that going on. What is that? And you look into the mirror and you see the truth of who you are. And the Bible here tells us in the book of James that we need to look into the mirror and not forget. And if we're all honest with ourselves, we need to look in that mirror and we need to confess things like, I've not been very patient this week. Boy, with all that's going on in our world around us, I look in the mirror and I think I'm starting to detect worry marks or signs of fretting or of fear or something like that. But everywhere you look, by the way, you find people questioning. But if they would just look into the word of God and to the church, I'm saying that I believe Christ is saying to us, I'm writing you a letter and I'm asking you to look and for you to see what I'm showing you. God says, I want to show you new things in your life and for your life. But I believe that God is doing these things in mercy. I really do. Tremendous mercy. Uh, fourth thing is this. That's the fourth thing, right? What did we look at? Number one was listening to what I'm saying to you. Second is to uh, look at what I'm showing you. 
I'm sorry, third thing. The third thing is lean into what I'm doing in you. Number three, number three. God writes to Ephesus, he writes to you and me, and I think God is saying that he wants you and I to lean into what he's doing. It says in verse three, and you have persevered. These are all great things. And have patience. Interesting, huh? Second time he's mentioned that. And have labored for my namesake. Second time he's mentioned labored as well. But listen, you, you've had patience and you've labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. All of these things are beautiful attributes, beautiful traits for sure. Mark this down. Once again, the book of James. James 1 verse 2 says, My brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ, count it all joy. That means take the truth of the Bible and look at the, the danger and the uncertainty of the moment that you are seemingly in, do the math, and come to this conclusion. All joy should be the answer when you fall into various trials. That's where all of us are at right now. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. That's what you and I are going through right now. Right now. That's a merciful act of God. Praise the Lord. I want to encourage you right now with that. We're going through a fiery trial. And he goes on to tell us, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be complete or perfect, lacking nothing. God is at work in our lives. And I have a question for you right now regarding that. What is God doing in your life during these days of mercy? What's he saying? How has he been displaying himself to you? Have you been picking up your Bible more? We know this for a fact, by the way. Uh, there are various websites, various Christian uh, researchers that are telling you, that can tell you, that they've had world record amounts of downloads of their Bible apps. There's been more Bibles downloaded under their devices, or uh, Christian book sales of Bibles have skyrocketed around the world. Isn't that awesome? Man, I don't mean to offend anybody out there that's of some other religion. But I gotta tell you, man, when the going gets tough, people go to the Bible. Think about why. It's because the God of the Bible speaks. And he's speaking to us. He's speaking to you. And the beautiful thing about all of this is the fact that what God is doing right now we're to lean into that. You say, what do you mean lean into that? What does that mean? What I, what I mean by lean in, I mean by not resisting what God is doing. Now, I'm going to, I'll put it to you one way, and then I'll segue to something that's personal. When we lean in, that is we embrace or we say to God, I want to get everything out of this that you are trying to instruct in me. Church at Ephesus, Jesus was saying, I'm judging you. He has that authority. I'm judging you, and this is the good, and in a moment, I'm gonna point out the not good. But this is what I want you to do with what I'm saying to you. I want you to embrace it, or we would say in Christianity, to lean into it, to press into it, not to resist. To resist is to be stubborn. To resist is to push back. Nope, you stand and you say, God, the shelves are getting bare, or we're all sick, or we're out of money. And God, I'm gonna go with trusting you. You know everything, God. And we cry out to you. And you press into his promises. And listen, you lean into the situation. Number four is that we learn. Jesus would say, my dear Ephesus, I've written you a letter, so learn what it is I'm teaching you. Verses four and five, nevertheless, I have this against you. Now this is Judge Jesus. Jesus the judge. You have left your first love. Remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent, notice, and do the first works, or else 
I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand. Not plural, by the way. Lampstand, singular. There's seven. Ephesus, get what I'm teaching you. Christian, get what you're hearing from God and what he's showing you. Lean into it. Learn from this. Or else I'll have to come along and set you aside as a witness. You'll be unusable. You'll be not a tool in my hand and it'll be a tragedy. What is it that I'm teaching you? What a tremendous word this is. In your Bibles, mark it. Look at it carefully. You might want to highlight. Verse 4 tells us, Nevertheless, I have this against you. This is stressing the fact that Jesus Christ, hallelujah, is the judge of his own church. It's not a committee. It's not a board. It's not a pastor. It's Jesus. I don't, I don't say this to offend any church leader, but all of us who are in leadership regarding his church are at best sheepdogs. He's the shepherd. He's the one that's in control, and he's the one that has the authority to judge us. And in his mercy, he judges. And we want to hear, and we want to know, we want to learn, we want to lean into what he's saying. And this is what he's announcing, that we have left our first love. That's the shout that I pray I can make to the church in America today, is that right now we have wake, awakened to the fact that we have left our first love. We have become more passionate about things and about stuff than about sitting alone with Jesus and learning from him. We've spent more time gleaning from the internet or listening to sermons than we have sat and waited to hear from the Holy Spirit of God. The word, listen, mark it down, the word left, to have left your first love, the word means to neglect. Anyone who has ever been or is in love with someone else it's easy to neglect when we get preoccupied. It means to leave alone. And there's a, there's a word that is implied here that it's, it's not a deliberate, I'm leaving you. Oh, no, no, no. It's not a vacating of everything. It implies, by the way, if you were to stick a microphone in the face of the pastor at the church at Ephesus and you would ask that pastor, do you love Jesus? That pastor would say, we love Jesus. Yes, we do. We love Jesus. How about you? And just as he points that finger, it's God saying to him, but have you stopped long enough? When was the last time you labored through a sermon that you didn't get downloaded from the internet or you didn't get off of some other source, but I gave it to you? He warns the pastors. And what about the Christians? What about me? What about you? Have we left our first love when, when Jesus was our all in all? That word left also means this. It means to drift away slowly. It means to slip away. This is one of the dangers of love. If it's not maintained, it can slip away. The word can also be translated to permit. That is in the negative. To tolerate. That's in the negative to tolerate and to permit that, that which breaks or goes about to break our love connection. This convicts me sorely because it's almost too painful. You look in the mirror and you ask the Lord, Lord, in my own life, have I left you as my first love? Have I left you in any way, Lord? God demands, by the way, a singularity of his love. The Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, begins in verse 6, and it says, Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is strong as death, jealousy is fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. The love of God, the intimacy of God. At a time like this church all around the world, is it possible that God is using this virus to get us to just simply have distractions removed from us? 
How long will it last? Nobody knows. What if God were to say that I'm the judge of all the earth and I'm calling out not to the unbeliever but to the believer and I'm calling out to say to you, you've left your first love. There was a day when you were crazy about me. You wouldn't stop talking about me. You read everything about me. You would sit and you would read the Gospels. You would read my scriptures. You would start in Genesis and you would end in the book of Revelation. And you were in love with me. And you sang in your crazy, silly little voice. You would sing to me songs. You would walk or do whatever you were doing. And you would pause and say, thank you, Jesus, for just being mine. When was the last time? Is that love for Jesus fierce? It can be again. It needs to be. It better get fierce again. That's what he's saying to us. Is it fierce? Is it jealous for him? You know, God's jealous for us. His love is jealous for us in a very powerful way. And then the word first left your first as here, first love. Listen to this. You're going to recognize this immediately. First is the word protos in Greek. It's where we get the word prototype. It means the first, the best, the one. The one. There is, listen, I'll keep this uh, surface level because there may be young ears in the audience. But this word left your first love, the word in, in a common sense would mean You slipped away from the one that you gave yourself away to first. Who was it that had you first? Who was it that you gave yourself to first? All of the emotions were there. All of the passion. All of the commitment. And you gave yourself over fully, body, soul, and spirit, to be in love. And... uh, The Bible warns us here that we've left that first love. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 1. Jeremiah 2, 1 says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry into the hearing of Jerusalem, and say, Thus says the Lord, I remember you. Wow. The kindness of your youth. This is the Lord speaking to Jerusalem. The love of your betrothal. The The love of our engagement. God is saying, when you went after me in the wilderness in a land not sown. What does that mean, land not sown? When you were so crazy in love with me, you pursued me, you would follow me anywhere, and and you would, listen, you and I would meet in places that were far removed from everything else just to be alone with each other. What a beautiful but painful cry that God Laments. Love cannot survive alone. And Christian, I speak to us, we need to love him now more than ever. We need to check our hearts. On this, the first step of seven visits of the seven churches, we need to start with where God starts. And he says, you've left your first love. In this hour of mercy, this hour of divine opportunity, still some are being distracted. Even now, And God is saying to you, he's shouting to you to turn to him, to turn back to him. We're so easily distracted. I'm preaching and I'm teaching that the the very elements of this nature where there's nobody here, I don't like it, you don't like it. We want to get together. But there's there's a preaching aspect of this rather than the teaching, though teaching is going on. I like the classroom setting. But the temptation to be distracted is brutal. That's the number one thing I was in trouble in going to school all my life. Every year my parents would get a note from my teachers Jack keeps looking out the window. Jack is easily distracted. And I remember in the sixth grade, Miss Dobson took my 
chair, my table, and took it out away from all the other students and put my back to the window. And you know what that did to me? Absolutely nothing. I just kept looking over my shoulder until I got in big trouble. Those of us who are easily distracted wind up getting in big trouble. We need to focus again on our love, to stare at Jesus in our love. And then he says to remember. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Remember. When was it that you were crazy about Jesus without apology? Go back there. Remember what you were doing. Remember where that was and when that was. And do those things again. And doing those things again implies repentance. We need to repent and here's the word. Do you remember earlier in the opening I said, many pastors around the world are teaching sermons today about hope and about peace and about encouragement? With all due respect, you can't hear a message of hope. I'm only talking to the Christian right now. You can't hear a message of hope. You cannot hear a message of peace. You cannot hear a message of encouragement, according to Jesus, until you repent. This is the first word. This is the word that the gospel begins with. Repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Repentance, metanoia, change your mind. And that applies even to the believer to get back. He says, or else I will come quickly and remove your candlestick, your light, your illumination from its place unless you repent. I don't have much time. I have to hurry, but I don't want to miss this profound bit of history. And just to keep myself from being distracted, I'm going to read it. In the history of England, in the 1600s specifically, there was what was known as the Great Ejection. It was the systematic silencing of the pastors who refused to nationalize their churches under the king. 2,000 English pastors were silenced. They were the most effective, passionate, Bible-teaching pastors. They were, listen, I'm not kidding. Listen up, everybody. They were ordered by the realm, by the king, by the crown, listen, to, and I quote, shut up, close quote, to shut up, a 16th century term meaning to shut the mouth. It means to board it up. It means to cease the words or to stop speaking that. The crown of England said to 2,000 English pastors, shut up about the gospel. Stop preaching the Bible. One of those precursors to those wonderful leaders, was a man by the name of William Tyndale. You may have a Bible that is published by Tyndale, and uh, it's, it bears his name. That's William Tyndale, 1536, in London, England. Listen to this. He said, I call God to record against the day we shall appear before our Lord Jesus that I never altered one syllable of God's word against my conscience, nor would do this day if all that is in earth, whether it be honor, pleasure, or riches, might be given to me. Today, more than ever, the church and the Christian must not compromise because our love for God would not allow it. And those 2,000 English pastors were shut up from public speaking uh, by order of the realm. And I'm going to give you one guess as to what those 2,000 pastors did. Did they shut up? Did they have their mouths boarded up? Not one moment. The edict was decreed. They preached anyway. Some of them were driven out of the church, so they preached in the streets. They preached in the open air. They preached in the fields. And they called people back to repentance. And they preached against a godless nation and a godless king. 
We need to go back and do our first works. When we were reckless with our own lives and we didn't care what people thought and we weren't swayed by opinions and we, listen, we didn't fear even death because Jesus, that life and love that he has given us is stronger than the grave. It's more powerful than the arm. And so we need to repent. Oh, and by the way, historians and sociologists tell us that from the time of the great ejection, the realm of England just descended down, down, down. It went from one plague after the next. What, listen, plague. And one economic failure after the next to the losing of one battle after the next until the crown of England, which once spanned the world, began to diminish. England went after its pastors. England silenced its preaching. And but for a few candles that were blowing in that wind, the likes of which George Whitfield and Charles Spurgeon. For a moment there was a flicker of light, but England has to this day continued to decline. And today, by and large, the churches of England are empty. But there's a remnant that's not silent. The building may be empty, but God is awakening his people in England. And he's awakening his people in Spain. And right now God is awakening his people in Iran. And then fifth and finally, we end. My dear Ephesus, I write, or I've written you this letter. So let what I'm working on be done. Just let me go to work. God, let me work should be our prayer because God wants to work in us. He says in verses six and seven, but this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Those are the religious leaders who flex their spiritual muscle, as it were, which is really carnal. They lorded their authority over people. They controlled people. Nico uh, is uh, the people, or the lords, and laity are the people. Nicolaitans is the lords over the people. And Jesus says, I hate that. Isn't that awesome? Doesn't that give you a... Uh, I, it gives me a rush. First of all, I've never assumed any authority whatsoever. And, I'll, and by God's grace, I'll be the last one to receive any authority if he gives me any very well. But there are those who love it. They've got to have it. Their name's got to be out front. They're, they've got to have all of these things behind their name. They've got to have that seat. They've got to have that Thing. They've got to have that recognition and they've got to have that area of respectability and my name means everything. I'm, I'm very, very proud of my reputation. Oh, God says stick it in your ear. God says get over yourself. You're a legend in your own mind and only your mind, so forget about it. You need to repent. You need to love God first because we don't have a reputation. We are nobodies without him. And God says, I hate those that rule over people like that. Verse seven, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is saying to the church and to him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life. That's awesome. And in the midst of the, that is in the midst of the paradise of God. Let God work. You wanna know why? Coronavirus or not? If you're trusting Jesus Christ, you're going to heaven. Did you know that? Hey, listen, I'm gonna end right here with some verses. Get ready, gonna be a bunch of them. Going to go fast, but I want to give you these. And this is your homework for the rest of the week. Uh, before I do, I want you to know, if you, if you don't know this, this thing's gone on long enough now. A lot of research, round the clock. And uh, this weekend, the news, even this morning, scientists are arguing with each other now. Well, this is how you can contract it. This is how you are safe from it. 
this is what it is, this is what it isn't, this is what it will do to you, this is what it will not do to you, this is who it attacks and this is who it doesn't attack, this is when it started, no, this is when it started, all conflicting. And there's some scientists, forgive me, I forget where, but it's a big deal, it's a big place. He said that um, at the current analysis of the flu season for 2019 and 2020, the winter, it's not exceptional. You say, what are you talking about? We're hiding in our houses. I'm just telling you that they are now debating how long this thing has been with us. I'm going to confess something to you. I had the worst flu I ever had in my life in December, near Christmas time. Four days, huge fever, out of my mind fever, slight dry cough, body aches, worst flu I've had in 20 years. There's no way for me to be tested to see if I had coronavirus. But the more and more people I talk to, they say the exact same thing. It just so happens that all the symptoms I had are all the symptoms that are being published right now on the web. What's my point? My point is this. God's got this. No matter what people say, they don't know what they're talking about. You and I have been tempted to worry by the word of man rather than staying calm upon the word of God. So get ready, because here comes your anti-corona device prescription. Joshua chapter one, beginning of verse six. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as inheritance the land which I swore to your fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. In other words, keep yourself in the word. That you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, and you shall observe to do according to all that is written in it. All that is written in it. I've written you a letter. Chino Hills. I've written you a letter, Chicago. I've written a letter to you, Frankfurt. I've written it that you may make your way prosperous and that you may have good success. Have I not commanded you be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Next, Deuteronomy 31.6. Deuteronomy 31.6, Jesus' favorite book. He quoted more Deuteronomy than any other book of the Bible. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear. Do not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Isaiah 43, verse 2. We're almost done. But when you pass through the waters... I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall any flame scorch you. You say, Jack, this doesn't exactly apply to the virus. Yeah, it does perfectly. Because for the Christian, even if it takes our life, it can't take our life. Psalm 23, verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. John 16, 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have difficulty or tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Isaiah 41, 10. Fear not. For I am with you, do not be dismayed, don't be undone. For I am your God, I will strengthen you, yes, I will uphold you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, says God. Final passage, 1 John 5, beginning in verse 11. 
And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. Listen now. And he who does not have the son does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the son of God. In the name of the son of God. Do you know his name? That you may know that you, are, that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the only Son of God or the definite article Son of God. It means there's not another one coming. My dear friend, as we end right now, I want you to pray with me in closing. No matter who you might be, believer, unbeliever, listen up. We're going to pray right now, and you can own this prayer or you can reject it. But at this hour, before you can have his hope, as a person, church, or nation, before we can have his peace, before we can have his encouragement, we must repent as a people, as a church, and as a nation. Repentance means that we are brutally sorry to God for what we've done in our lying, in our sin. Let's pray. Let's just quiet down in our homes. Let's quiet our hearts. Kids, bow your heads. Mom and dad, bow your head. Young married couple, bow your head. Hardened, stiff-necked atheist, why are you listening right now? Because God wants you to bow your head and own this. Dear Lord God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I come to you by the authority of the Son of God. And I ask you, Father, to hear my confession that I receive this letter written to me. And I want to confess to you, God, that I've left my first love. I've had so many other things pull me away. Money, sex, demands, pressure, tension, sports, fashion, pleasure. I've been distracted. You have been somewhere, Jesus, on a list of mine. And you've cleared my calendar now, almighty God. And I find myself this morning only with Jesus. My family may be with me right now, or my friends, or I might be alone in this room. But the fact of the matter is I do find myself now calling out to Jesus, considering Jesus. And my friend, I pray that you would pray to accept Christ. If you're not a believer today, that you'd say, Christ, I believe you died for me on the cross, rose again from the dead, as the Bible says. I don't understand it all, but I believe your word. My heart's being pricked and prompted to believe you. And God, I just opened up my life to you, and I pray that you'd come in and do whatever you do when you save someone, because I'm receiving you now. And I understand this prayer doesn't do magic upon me. I'm just telling you, God, that right now, according to Romans chapter, or excuse me, according to John chapter 1, verse 12, I'm receiving you. And to the believers, all of us, we rededicate our lives to you, Lord, in this quiet hour, in the silence of this moment. I recommit my love, I ask you, almighty God, restoke the flames of first love passion in my heart for you. Oh God, prompt us to meet you early in the morning and to talk to you upon our pillow at night. Lord, we renew now the conversation of the day being wrapped around you. We give you these things. We pray, almighty God, for the healing of our nations. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ as City, county, state, and nation repents of their sins. 
that we begin to see an absolute instantaneous stop of this plague, of this virus. And Lord, in one moment, technically, you could even lose, use this message right now to go around the world in an hour, and this entire plague could stop in an hour. And we ask you, Father, to heal and to save those that are sick and those that are affected by this. Thanks for watching the Real Life YouTube channel. We love bringing you content that will help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You can subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss one single video or live stream and you can share it with friends and family. If you'd like to support this ministry by helping us reach others, by taking the gospel and the teaching around the world, you can do so by clicking the Give Now button. So thanks again for watching and God bless.